All right, guys, welcome back. Hour number two. We're so glad you're with us. And joining us right now from New Jersey is our good friend, Will Sherlin. Will, how you doing? I'm doing great, Pastor Paul. All things considering, how are you guys over there? We're doing good. We're doing good. And uh, we're trying to make, uh, we're trying to understand what's going on in not only in the Middle East, but right here at home let's i tell you what let's start with here at home uh the president of the united states has covid he's in the hospital but we're hearing he's 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 getting better uh but it's so strange that he the first lady the press secretary two senators um and i don't know who all uh that come down with covid and it happened they're trying to trace it back to the announcement of uh, amy coney barrett what is your your thoughts on this and what what do you know about this well, Pastor Paul, I've been tracking this a little bit. I know that COVID really is a nasty disease. It's uh, something that, you know, I have I was dodging this thing overseas right before the pandemic happened. And I got back stateside and I thought, you know, oh, thank gosh, now I'm safe. And boom, it happened over here as well. Um, I'm obviously a firefighter here, so I've had firsthand experience going into nursing homes and things and seeing the kind of devastation that this thing has wreaked, uh, especially on the older population. And it really is a nasty, nasty thing. And I really think that um, what we're looking at here is a bioweapon from China. I don't know, you know, purposely, non-purposely, it did work out quite well for their for their favor. So it's, it's the type of thing where I think, look, uh, our President Trump, he likes to lead from the front. He didn't want to sit in the White House and hide away in a basement or anything like that. He wanted to be leading from the front. And this thing was kind of bound to get him eventually. And I really think that he knew that full well. He went out there. He uh, he did what he had to do. He's a strong man. He's not afraid of it. Uh, but, you know, he's dealing with the consequences of that now. And that's just what happens. I mean, I know that our president actually, uh, if I'm not mistaken, came down with the Spanish flu during the 1918 pandemic. So I really think that a strong leader just, you know, he says, hey, this could happen, but I'm not afraid of it. I'm going to just lead and uh, and lead well. Well, let's talk about that because, you know, the, the media, uh, it's really amazing. You That is a great analogy you just came up with. Leading from the front and not afraid. Uh, didn't hide in the bunker like Joe Hyden, uh, but instead he was out there. And, and so, but now the media wants to say that he was reckless, that he hasn't taken care of the American public, that he's been running around, ignoring the situation, downplaying the situation, and now look at the mess he's in and instead your analogy is no 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 he's taken this thing on headlong he's never backed down he has stayed on the job and he's also constantly said it's the china flu or the Wu flu he's blamed this on china constantly and uh, he refuses to back down on that he knows this came out of china and that china so he doesn't call it a, uh he doesn't call it a bioweapon but you get the sense that that's really what he wants to say yeah you definitely do and whether he can say that or not i mean obviously our economy chinese economy everything's linked right now right it's a global global economy so you can't really necessarily go out and say hey, this was a bioweapon because that would be a declaration of war. It really would, and we're kind of obligated at that point to respond. So I think that while he would really love to tell us, uh, yes, this is what happened, uh, I, you know, I think he's also just being cautious and saying, you know, we don't necessarily need to disclose that at this point. Would he like to? Would Look, China has the 2030 initiative, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and basically what that is is they really want to ramp up their military and get everything as strong or stronger than us and NATO uh, by 2030 at the latest. So, you know, whether we're going to see some kinetic action before then, who knows? But um, it probably wouldn't really be in anybody's economic interest to go ahead and do that. But I really, I mean, look, all of my contacts right now are telling me there's no question about it. You know, it was a laboratory engineered thing. Whether or not it was purposely done remains to be seen. But I just don't think that we're able to fully disclose that to the American people right now. Although Trump does seem to, um, you know, kind of come out and vaguely, vaguely admit that to the best of his ability. Will, a uh, great analogy again, Will, on this. Folks, this is Will Sherlin. He's in New Jersey. Will, tell them how they can find your broadcast that you do. 
Absolutely. Um, so we are on Gutter Fighting Secrets, uh, Gutter Fighting Secrets on YouTube, on Instagram. We also have GutterFightingSecrets.com where we offer free blogs, analysis. We do um, some pretty cool products as well. Right now, we're focusing on our National Emergency Preparedness Program. And basically what that is, is we've taken a handful of really knowledgeable people, guys that work within, um, I'll just say, different sectors, and they are able to really help people prepare. You know, it can be a daunting task to prepare ourselves for a national emergency. But really the planning and preparation is what will save you in the end. Everything from my experience has taught me that proper planning prevents poor performance. So when we talk about, hey, what do we need to do to go ahead and keep ourselves, our families safe while American cities seem to burn, while things just seem to get worse and worse and worse throughout the world, um, there is a lot to it. But basically what you want to do is plan ahead of time. You want to have a route route or a route mapped out you want to know hey if things get crazy in the city that i'm living in where am i gonna go um you know maybe you have a small vacation cabin or house somewhere out in the country well what do you put in there do you want to stock it with food what kind of food do you want to stock it with maybe you need an alternate communications plan if you know the cell phone networks go down do you have a ham radio something like that these are all things that Really, it's best left to the experts. Now, you could research this for yourself. I know there's a lot of great preppers out there, and I'm really all for that. I think that if we prepare as a society, as a civilization, then no matter what happens, we can come back fighting. But I also understand that not everybody's got all the time in the world to go and research this and plan, which is where we come in at Gutter Fighting Secrets National Emergency Preparedness Program. And we're going to have guys from ex-special forces, um, guys in the State Department who work in the housing security uh, field, guys like wilderness, um, RNs and doctors, we're going to have a whole team available for you here. And they're going to come in and advise you exactly what you need to do from A to B. We've got different levels of programs there. But just go ahead. If anybody out there is interested, feel free to get in contact on our website, gutterfightingsecrets.com. And uh, shoot me an email at gutterfightingsecrets at gmail.com. And we can definitely go ahead and start talking about this. Great program, folks. And he's on top. I met Will in New Jersey, over in Newark, New Jersey, when I was holding a conference there, uh, I think about four years ago. And, and you were uh, on your way over to the Holy Land. I was. I was on the way to the Holy Land. I'm going to leave the next morning, I think, to catch a plane. And uh, we did a conference over in Newark, New Jersey. Had about 100 people or so come and had a great time. And we met Will there. Since then, Will has really stepped up his game. And again, his uh, gutterfightingsecrets.com. That's gutterfightingsecrets.com. All right, Will, let's talk about this. Azerbaijan, or I think that's how you say it, and Armenia. Azerbaijan attacks Armenia. We know those two have fought each other many times, with the last time being in the early 90s. And uh, here we are again, and all of a sudden, a lot of countries are jumping in this thing. And nobody can figure this one out. I was on the phone with Agent uh, 2020 earlier today, and we're like, what in the world? It seems like different people are jumping on different sides what is going on there and you've you've been to turkey i, I think if i if i'm right you were in turkey earlier this year so can you tell us a little bit about what's going on in that part of the world yeah absolutely so as far as turkey is concerned first of all and then we'll circle back to the uh armenia azerbaijan situation so Turkey is an interesting thing, uh, Pastor Paul. I noticed you were talking about it before, and um, Erdogan is really an interesting character. Now, I'm going to be careful what I say here. However, yes, I was in Turkey um, right before, again, before the pandemic hit. I was over in the Middle East, and Turkey was one of the countries that I happened to go to. Now, I was talking with some of the people there, and, um, you know, Erdogan is really a zealot, right? He's really all about the... Um, resurgence of the uh, Islamic Brotherhood and all of this type of stuff. We saw the attempted coup a number of years back in Turkey trying to get him out of power and then he you know, miraculously survived that and you know, even got stronger I think after that. But a lot of Turks really aren't, um, they're not too thrilled with him and I think that they really think that what he's doing, a lot of Turks are very secular um, from what I was listening to and talking with the guys and girls out there 
you know, it, it's the type of thing where he is one way and I think the Turkish people are another way. So I think we should distinguish between um, what President Erdogan is doing and then what the Turkish people want. So, but, you know, I really do. I think that we're looking at something pretty crazy here. And you were talking about the Gog Magog team. And it is really interesting to me that, you know, Turkey and Russia, it, it seems to me with this uh, Armenia and um, Azerbaijan thing, Aren't they kind of at odds right now? I mean, Russia kind of said they might back Armenia, and then obviously you've got Turkey heavily involved with Azerbaijan right now. Right. It's uh, It seems interesting, and it just seems like someone's going to need to step in at some point and broker a peace deal between all of these nations here. You know, it's true because uh, you, on one hand, Turkey and Russia and Iran have been holding summits together really about Syria and about Israel. And to all of a sudden have this breakout and Russia's on Armenia's side and Turkey's on Azerbaijan's side, uh, you know, and then you got Iran's in there and uh, every, and Israel's in there. Uh, everybody's like choosing sides and France is throwing out their, they're throwing their hat in the ring. But Trump is staying out of this one. Sort of like Trump is saying, uh, you know, we've got our hands full. We've, you know, we're tired of these wars in the Middle East. So, uh, what do you think? I mean, will this thing get really, really bloody? It's already been pretty nasty. What, what's your thoughts? Yeah, so, I mean, the last statistic I saw was there was over 3,000-something casualties, um, and that's just, I believe that's just military casualties on the Azerbaijan side, and considerably less on the Armenian side. So it's definitely already getting nasty. Now, I know that uh, Turkey's got their Grey Wolf Special Forces unit inside Azerbaijan as we speak, uh, that's not confirmed because Turkey isn't um, admitting that they're over there, although we've seen pictures of guys with their unit patches on over over there. Um, we've also got the uh, SNA, which is formerly the Free Syrian Army, and they're in Azerbaijan acting as mercenaries right now, along with Libyans. So it's interesting how Turkey and um, Turkey really, well, really Turkey is sending in these mercenaries to Azerbaijan, which is, I mean, who would have guessed, right? It's just a, the craziest thing. And I really think that it's only a matter of time before this situation deteriorates even further. You know, you're bringing out some uh, points that I have not heard in the media anywhere. Uh, and that is that at the SNA, you know, the Syrian National Army would actually be in Azerbaijan uh, fighting as mercenaries on, on their side, along with the uh, Turkish elitist groups that are in there. And also we know Turkey's using drones for doing strikes on uh, Azerbaijan tanks and armored vehicles. And also Turkey's F-16 fighter jets have been flying in there and doing strikes. So Turkey is definitely leading us. And look at this breaking news headline. I didn't even get a chance to get to this yet. Iran is sending at least 200 tanks to its border with Armenia and Azerbaijan. But guess what? They're sending them to to help Armenia. So mm, do, do, what an interesting twist this is. So it's who, who's helping who, uh, you know, and uh, <laughs> yeah. I, should we follow the money? I mean, is there some kind of natural resources in that part of the area of the world that is so important that? Everybody is trying to figure out how to get a piece of the pie or what in the world is going on. It just shows you that the rules of warfare and that there's no allegiances anymore. Oh, by the way, Turkey's supposed to be a NATO country. OK, they're rogue as rogue can get. So what's your thoughts, Will? Yeah, it's really interesting that you bring that up about, about Iran. And, you know, typically I don't really look to Europe, Eastern Europe, as far as stuff goes. I'm usually kind of keeping an eye on Jerusalem in the Middle East, but... It really boggles my mind that Iran's kind of getting involved here on the Armenian side. Now, could that potentially be uh, the Iranian-Russian alliance? Who knows? Um, and like you said, Pastor, there probably is some precious resources or something going on here. I think most wars are kind of, you know, fought on an economic front as well these days. So it's, it's really interesting what's going on there. Uh, folks, this is Will Sherlin. Will, Will Sherlin with us. He's from GutterFightingSecrets.com. That's GutterFightingSecrets.com. Will, let's talk about Jerusalem. Let's talk about Israel a little bit. I mean, what about the fact that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu 
uh, has uh, been able to survive three elections and he's got an 18 month reign left. To, uh, he's in the middle of and uh, President Trump's deal of the century. Uh, the fact that we've got several nations now signing on another five nations about ready to sign on. What's your thoughts on what's going on here as it relates to Israel and uh, geopolitical issues and and biblical prophecy? Yeah, so I noticed that Oman actually is thinking about signing on to this deal. Um, I really thought that Saudi Arabia would be next. You know, you've got um, bin Sal Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince, he's kind of got a newer, fresher perspective on things. I think he wants to, you know, let women drive and, you know, kind of relax some things a little bit and progress towards, um, I, um, excuse me, not Iran, Saudi Arabia becoming more of a, a tourist destination. I think, like, you know, the UAE obviously realizes that um, tourism is kind of their bread and butter now, and I think Saudi Arabia is kind of moving that way as well. Um, these Gulf nations, it really, it kind of came out of nowhere for me that all of these Gulf nations all of a sudden are going to all sign on. I know Oman, and I was just over there when uh, Sultan Qaboos died, and I know they've got a, uh, a new Sultan Al Said, uh, I think his name is. And, um, you know, usually Oman has been a very neutral country, almost the Switzerland of the Middle East. So I was surprised to hear that they're entertaining signing on to this peace deal but it really really i mean it makes sense to be honest with you because israel is such an economic powerhouse i mean they've got all the tech industry out there and everything so to normalize relations with uh israel and kind of say hey listen we understand that the palestinian yes islamic brotherhood all of that stuff and i'm not saying islamic brotherhood is as in the organization but islamic brotherhood is as in, you know, yes, they want to support the Palestinian people to the best of their ability, but, hey, I mean, how long is it going to be until economic interests really need to be at play here? So I, I think it's really, I think it's a great thing. But, um, again, on the other hand, what you always say, Pastor, is about the covenant of many. We need to be aware of what could potentially be happening here as far as scripture and prophecy goes. Again, a, f a great analogy again, Will. I didn't know you were in uh, Oman. How many countries did you visit when you were over in the Middle East? I was in, uh, let's see, I think five or six different Arab nations over there. Very interesting. So Turkey, Oman. Uh, Turkey, Oman, I was in the UAE. Uh, I went to Jordan as well and a couple other nations. I actually speak fluent Arabic, so it's easy for me to travel um, over in the Middle East. Now that I know you speak fluent Arabic, uh, remind me the next time I go to the Middle East to take you along with me. <laughs> okay. It does help out. Yeah. Yeah. And well, Heidi's learning Arabic right now as well as uh, she's learning Aramaic, I should say. Excuse me. She's learning Aramaic, Greek, and Hebrew. But still, we could throw you in there with Arab arabic and you speak it fluently that's amazing so you've been to these countries recently and got a feel for the flavor um and when you when you bring up um well was you in kuwait no you weren't okay so the new emir just took over right uh the new emir wants to do a deal with israel the old emir who just died didn't and if you're wondering about saudi arabia i found this out this morning it's because king salman doesn't want to do a deal with israel but saudi crown prince ben mohammed bin salman does so look for and he's the guy of the future there's no doubt about it so there's going to be some shifting and changing. Saudi Arabia will come around. It's too much money on the table. Um, look for some something taking place over there. Yeah, I fully agree with that. Uh, I really think that uh, this new crown prince is kind of the future of Saudi Arabia. And what I mean by that is I really think that he wants to normalize relations between you know Saudi and the Western countries and even Israel. It's It's going to be a good thing, I think. Now, I mean... Obviously, Saudi Arabia, there's a lot of issues that we see within that country. There's a lot of, you know, frankly speaking, barbaric stuff that happens. But I think that if they can start to kind of start the process, start the ball, ball rolling of normalization for that country, as much as, you know, as much as normalization can be normalized in the Middle East, I think that that will be an excellent thing, not only strategically for the United States and Israel, but just for, you know, the geopolitics of that region in general. 
You're a firefighter also, so you're pretty young and in good shape, aren't you? I, I get by. Okay, I got your number. I got your number. Looks like you're going to be going to the Middle East with me. Okay, Will, thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you for your great analogy. We'll have you back soon. Appreciate it. Thank Pack you. your bags. Get ready to go again. <laughs> Will Sherling, folks. Thank you, Will, so much. Will Sherling, guys. Um, good guy. Good guy. And, um, you know, he's just, I love the fact he's got his head on straight. He's a good Christian. He loves the Lord. He's studying what's going on in this country as well as what's taking place in uh, the Holy Land area, the Middle East area. He's got a good feel for biblical prophecy. He's hungry to learn. And the fact that he just recently traveled to these five different nations, I didn't, I knew he did that, but I didn't know that he spoke Arabic. And that's great to know because that can help understand deciphering some of this information that we get um, that we sometimes don't know exactly what they're saying in Arabic. It's really good to know we got somebody who can help us in that. Anyway, God's, uh, God will add to the church daily such as should be saved. Uh, I want to say to you right now, as we're dealing with these things, let me give you a, a, a couple more stories of things happening. 